thankful for the Spirit of God that is resting, ruling, and abiding in this place. So grateful for each and every one of you. I don't know about you, but I'm just simply excited about Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo. Hallelujah. So I just want to talk to you for the next few weeks as we enter into this, this season of worship and this season of, of recognizing the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we do know that December 25th is not the birthday of Jesus, but it is traditionally the time that we set aside to honor him and to recognize him and, and the gift that God has given each and every one of us in the form of him. Can we just give him a hand clap of praise? I mean, I mean, come on, just give God praise for this precious gift that he's given unto us. So I want to talk to you this morning. I want to talk to you very briefly. We're going to stay on point. Uh, I, want, I want to talk to you about the gift. And for the next three, four weeks, that's, that's, that's where our focus is going to be. It's going to be dealing with the gift going to be dealing with the gift because I, 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 I don't know about anybody else, but I love giving gifts and I definitely love getting gifts. Anybody like getting stuff? I tell you what, every time I get a gift, man, that I, I just appreciate it now, you know, especially, you know, the good ones. Amen. I say the good ones. When you, especially when you get something you want it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I, I, I appreciate gifts. So, that, yeah, I'm letting all y'all know I appreciate gifts, monetary gifts. I, I appreciate gifts, gift cards. <laughs> I'm just, just helping, you know, just, just helping you out there. Just in case you was wondering and you were stuck, gift cards, money, money, gift cards, gifts. Okay, all right. So watch this. God loves us so much that he has given us gift, the gift that has radically changed our life. You understand that the best thing about giving a, a gift is seeing it what? Being received. And then seeing those that receive what you're giving appreciate what's been given. Amen? Now, one, one of the most heartbreaking things is to think that you have gotten the perfect gift, you know, what, what you really, what you really want to bless a person with, what you, I mean, what you didn't work hard and saved and, and, and gathered, and you think you doing something and present this gift, and it be, I mean, just totally, oh, God, they give you the, mm, yeah, been there, whew, hallelujah, y'all pray for a brother today. But God has given us this gift, and, and what he knows is that if we just receive it, that it will radically change our life. That what he's put inside this gift, I, I, I mean, has the ability to move you past any problem, to bring you to your place of promise. Uh, I, but, but the struggle for us is to receive what God has prepared because it don't look like what you want. It's exactly what you need. It just always don't look like what you want. And, and, and God is in the gift-giving business of not giving you always what you want, but he promises to always give you what you need. Isaiah declares this. Isaiah, the eagle-eyed prophet is what he was known as, saw 720 years into the future, Isaiah saw the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in Isaiah, the ninth chapter, verses 6 and 7, this is what he pins. He says, for unto us a child is born, uh, to us a son is given. Now note this, you, you got to highlight a few things. And the government, you, you need to highlight government, shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called... It didn't say names with an S. It said, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Verse 7 uh, says, and of the increase of his government and the peace, 
there will be no end. You need to underline, there is no end to his government nor his peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So let's, 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 let's get into this. Let's, let's get into this because there was a whole lot being said. And, and you got to be able to receive this in order for the rest of what we're going to talk about for the next few weeks to make any sense. Here, the word gift in the Hebrew is the word materahe, and, and, and it means a present. Specifically, in a good sense, it means a sacrificial offering. So what God has given us in the form of his son Jesus is this sacrificial offer. In the bad sense, it says the same word means to bribe. Now watch this. It's amazing that God gives you a gift, but the enemy tries to present it as a bribe. And, and, and that there are times that we are manipulated because we confuse the gift, the sacrificial offering, with a bribe. And God will never, watch this, God will never present a bribe or try to bribe you to do anything. But what God has given you is the best that he has to radically change your life. A gift, a gift is, it says it's a notable capacity, a talent, or, in, or being endowed, uh, something voluntarily transferred by one person to another without compensation. The act the right or the power of giving. John 3, 16, uh, probably one of the most quoted verses in the Bible declares that the God so loved the world that he gave, he, he gifted us with his only begotten son that whosoever should believe on him would not perish but have eternal life. So, so, so what God gives us is not something that should be passing, but something that should permanently change us, permanently provide for us, permanently cover us. It, it's not like the atonement of old, where every year you had to bring your gift to the priest and uh, the blood had to be shed. But he gave us the sacrificial offering that forever paid the price, not only for your past sins, but for your future sins. That's a good reason to praise him right there. So when, when we talk about the promise of God, this, this gift that Isaiah saw 720 years before it came to pass, I, I, want you to, I want you to pull out four important things. It's first that Isaiah denotes that, that, that Jesus will come with a governmental rule. There will be an authority, a power assigned to him. Second, it says the authority of his position will give power to his name. Uh, thirdly, I'm sorry, three, 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 I said four, three. Three, uh, number three is that he will be your eternal ruler. So, so three points I got to walk away with. First, governmental rule. Second, there's be an authority of his position that gives power to his name. And thirdly, thirdly, he will be the eternal ruler. Let's deal with the governmental rule, the governmental rule. Uh, Luke 17, 20 says this, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. 1 Corinthians 4 and 20 reminds us of this, for the kingdom of God is not in words, but in power. So what we understand, what we understand through these two scriptures is that when God shows up, when the kingdom of God, the governmental rule that he's gifting us with, when it shows up, it does not manifest as a place. So this is what you can scratch out from here. He's not talking about heaven. He, he, he's not talking about when you get to heaven all of this is going to take place. Jesus says it's not a place because heaven ain't with, is not within us. Come on, man. Heaven is where we are designed to what? Get to. So he says that it, the kingdom of God can't be heaven. Then he says that the kingdom is not simply, watch this, in your quoting scriptures, it's in the power that's been assigned to the word of God that changes your life. 
So the kingdom, when we start looking at it, it says that the kingdom is a governing influence of a king over his territory, impacting, with his, with its, impacting it with his personal will, purpose, and intent. The kingdom produces a culture. It produces values, morals, and a lifestyle. Watch this, that reflects the king desires of his citizens. You, you got to underline that part if you took a picture. It didn't say that the kingdom of God was going to make you look how you want to look. It said that the kingdom of God was going to reflect the intent of the king. So you shouldn't be satisfied in life until your life looks like, mm. So if my life don't look like what Jesus has come to make my life to, or, or what God has described my life to be, then I can't be satisfied. I'm missing the mark. I'm living beneath my God-given privileges until my life mirrors that of the kingdom. Now, so, so when we start thinking about this, that, that what is the kingdom of God? Then if it's a territory, if it's influence, if it's impacting, if it has purpose, intent, if it produces cultures, values, and morals, it's not a place, it's a way of thinking. So when I think about the kingdom of God, it's not heaven, it's the mind of God. It's the mind of God that's revealed to me through his word. The word of God, it, Jesus says that my words are what? They, they are life. They are powerful. So we understand that when we start talking about the kingdom of God, we're talking about the mind of God that transforms us. Now we understand why they write, the writer writes in Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 1 and 2, that we got to first present our body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, for this is our reasonable service. Then be us transformed. How? by the renewing of our mind, that we release our mind, that the kingdom mindset can come into us. Are we all right this morning? I say, are we all right this morning? All right, all right, all right. It says that the kingdom of God means that God's will is executed. God's jurisdiction, his, his heaven's influence, God's administrations, and God's impact is happening in your life. The king, watch this, you got to live at this level, that the king is the only source of authority in his kingdom. That, that, that's what I love about this, that, that there is no free will thoughts once you come into the kingdom of God. Though his mindset is your mindset. His truth becomes your truth. His morals becomes your morals. So, so watch this. If I really submit myself to the God way of thinking, I don't have to argue with people about what I think. I don't have to keep trying to present nor defend my opinion because my opinion is that of the kingdom of God. Come on, man. Uh, so, so if you ask me what I think, what I think really isn't relevant unless I'm telling you what God has revealed to me. Because the, the most jacked up thing that church folks do is give people a whole lot of opinion. Who cares about your football coach used to say, white? Opinions are like, I'm going to be nice, buts. He said, everybody got one. Because if your opinion is relevant, then so is mine. Then if your opinion is right, then so is mine. What makes your opinion any better than mine? So we can't argue opinions. Amen. But if we submit our minds to the authority of the kingdom of God, our opinion becomes void, and the, world beco the word becomes true. So he says that the king is the only source of authority in the kingdom. There is nothing that rivals, watch this, there is nothing that challenges the thought of God in heaven. And the very thing that can try to, Revelations tells you, Isaiah tells you that it got cast out. So every time, watch this. Every time you start to try to get into your own way of thinking and your own way of doing, you simply begin to trespass against the will and the ways of God. Amen. And now you understand that why sometimes things sit, feel so hard or there's such a struggle in bringing this to pass is because I'm competing with the way God has designed or assigned me to do it. So, hmm. The authority of the position gives power to his name. There, 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 are four, 
there, there, there are four names. Well, actually, there's one name, eight words broken down into four parts that we need to look at to get understanding of. Isaiah writes that, that when the Savior comes, that when the Savior comes, he says he'll be wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Wonderful Counselor says that he'll be the giver of supernatural wisdom. Mm. James tells us this. James says that if any man lacks wisdom, you should ask of who? And he'll give it to you generously to all without finding fault. It will be given unto you. That watch, that God loves you so much that he's trying. Watch, you got to get this, man. He's not trying to withhold his mind from you, but God is trying to reveal his mind in you. That God does not want us functioning ignorant and, and lacking understanding of the principles of how the kingdom of God is governed. But he says, I, I'm making this known unto you. He says, and if you don't know, watch, all you got to do is ask me and I'll give it to you generously. So you got to understand when everybody keeps telling you, 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 you can't know the mind of God, God wants to reveal his mind to you. Isaiah 55 and 11, or Isaiah 55, somewhere around verses 6 through 8 talks about us being uh, brought back into our proper place. Let the wicked man forsake his ways, the unrighteous man his thoughts. That if we release our ways and we give up our thoughts, that God would return us unto him, and then we would know the mind of God. He says that when we are wicked and we are, watch this, unregenerated, that we can't process, we can't know, we can't flow from the mind of God. That's why he says, that we need to what? Give up our thoughts and our ways and receive that of the Lord. So when we lack wisdom and understanding, you got to understand that that's what God is trying to get to you, a kingdom wisdom and understanding. He's trying to reveal his mind to you. How else can you do what God has purposed you to do except you know what God has purposed you to do? And once you, watch this, once you start seeking your purpose in God, God will begin to give you strategies on how to fulfill that, what he's destined you to do. So the first says that God is a giver of wisdom, wonderful counselor. He's a giver of wisdom. Mighty God says is this, he's the giver of power. See, watch this. The first thing you got you to note that there's a particular order to this. God won't give you power without first giving you wisdom. Who would? We, we, get, we got what some people have described to be one of the most challenging presidents in the history of our time. But here's the truth. The man has a lot of power. The scary thing is, is does he have the wisdom to understand the power that comes with his position? And because God loves us so much, why would a loving father give you what you can't handle? So before he ever gives you power, God has to first ensure that you have, yeah, talk back to me. So watch this. It, God is not, man, there is no shortage of power for your life. But if you're praying for power and you've not first received wisdom, you're out of order. Is, is, is this helping anybody? That my first prayer really should be what? For the wisdom of God. What made Solomon the greatest king there ever was? That his prayer was not for power, his prayer was not for wealth, his prayer for, was not for great lands or great substance, his prayer was for wisdom and understanding. And because God saw his heart, he says, because of what you prayed for, I, I, I'm going to give you wisdom like no one else has had, but the wisdom that no one else has had brought him the wealth that no one else has had. So if you really want to be wealthy, your prayer is not for the thing. Your prayer is for the understanding, the wisdom to be able to properly manage the thing that you're desiring. Amen? So he says this. He says, Jesus, Luke 9, 1 and 2 says, And when Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them and to drive out all devils, 
I mean, I'm sorry, to drive out all demons and to cure all disease. Look at verse 2. And he sent them out to proclaim what? The what? The what? He empowered them. How? Through the mind of God. Why? Because he gave them the kingdom. He, remember that when the kingdom shows up, it doesn't just show up in words. It shows up with power. So he gave them everything they needed to radically change the lives of the individuals that they would come in contact with. Isaiah says that God has given us his son who works as the distributor of wisdom. But not only the distributor of wisdom, he says that he acts as the giver of power and authority. So not only with Jesus, watch this, not only having Jesus in your life or having Jesus as the head of your life, because the kingdom of every man is his head. It's the way you think. It's the way you process. It's your ability to believe and receive. Believe me, the devil ain't after your stuff. He's after your... Because what I can convince you to believe is all you will ever do. You won't do more than you believe you can do. No matter how much access you have to more, you won't do more than you believe you can do. So we got to receive Jesus, this gift. We got to receive him as wisdom. Then we got to receive him as power. Number three says we have to receive him as our everlasting father, the giver of endless love. Jeremiah 31 and 3 says this. It, it, it talks about, he says, the Lord appeared unto us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love and I've drawn you with unfailing kindness. That, that oh God, this is so good. That the love that God loves us with is what? Everlasting. Uh, that, that, that means before you was here, the love of God was already here. And after we're long gone, the love of God will still be here. See, what's the benefit of this? The benefit of that is that there is nothing I can do that moves me outside of God loving me. And that's so powerful. That means because every time I mess up, God gives me a way to make up. Oh, boy. It, 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 that, see, he ain't fickle like some of y'all. You know, uh, man, because I, I could tick some of y'all off and never see you again. But, but, but I love the part that, that, that Genesis 3 reveals to us that even after Adam and Eve sinned and God knew they sinned, the Bible says that he showed up asking the same question that he asked every day. Adam, where are you? It's time for our walk. It's time for me to revelate. It wasn't, watch this, it wasn't Ad, God that didn't show up because of sin. It was Adam that couldn't, oh man. So watch, it don't matter how messed up we are, God still shows up, and he shows up to love us to a place of restoring us. Ooh, that's good stuff right there, boy. That's good, that's good to know, see, that's good to see. See, see, see y'all, y'all, y'all must be all right. Must just be the fella sitting up here with the mic today that know how jacked up he is. And, 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 oh, man. That every day I need an everlasting God to love me with some everlasting love and some endless kindness. Because every day, I, I'm telling you, every day there's an opportunity for me to mess stuff up. And the only reason God still favoring me, the only reason benefits still showing up in my life. The only reason that we still connected ain't got nothing to do with me, but totally about how much God loves me. Just grateful that, that, that he loved me even past me. That Watch, that God loves us so much that you can't mess it up. Ooh, that's good right there. That's good right there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know you've been cheating on me, but come on back. Come on, man. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I know you've been talking behind my back, but come on back. Uh, I, I know you just stole my time, my talent, and my money, but come on back. That, that's, man, that's crazy love right there. Endless kindness. 
that God don't never stop trying to show you how much he cares about you. Even when you act like you don't care nothing about. Mm. I've drawn you with an endless or everlasting kindness. That it, that's the draw of God. That he doesn't respond. Oh, man, God. That he won't respond to you the way you present it to him. That when you give him messed up, he still gives you back love. Oh, when you give him come up short, he still comes through. Oh, man, y'all. He, he still comes through even when you come up short. So, so number four says that God is what? He's a, he presents Jesus to be our prince of peace. Now, you got to get the word peace. I wish I had some time because it is such a powerful word. That because we, we only think about peace as the absence of trouble or the absence of conflict. And, and, and literally, that's totally, totally the opposite of what peace is. Peace is a word of conflict. Whenever you pray for peace, you're praying for conflict. Because there is no peace without first you being willing to enter into the conflict. Are you understanding me? If you're praying for peace, it's already saying that there's something that's opposing you. In order for there to be peace, there has to be a greater authority that comes against that which is coming against you and utterly cast it down for you to have what appears to be peace. So Jesus doesn't say that I I'm giving you peace absence of conflict. It's the peace that he gives you in the midst of your conflicts. It's the confidence, the trust, the knowing that he is who he declares himself to be. That I am the God that will never leave you nor forsake you. That I'm the unfailing God. That I promise you this, that wherever you are, that's where I'll be also. It, it, it's the peace, it's the peace that Hebrews 4 talks about, that we can enter into his rest. Peace is the word, it's the root word where we get the word prosperity from. From the Hebrew shalom, prosperity, meaning nothing broken, nothing lacking, that we are prepared for every circumstance and situation. When God grants you his peace, there is nothing that comes against you that God is not already prepared to be an answer to. He says that Jesus is the giver of your peace. John 14, 27 says, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. This is Jesus talking. He says, I don't give you as the world gives, so don't let your hearts be troubled, and you don't have to be afraid. Why? Be because of the peace, my unfailing peace. Y'all get that there is not. Are, are you? Are, come on, God, take your time, wife. You got to get this, man. He says that the peace that He's giving us. It's not like the world. It doesn't look like. It's not temporary. It don't come up short. It's not for a particular people. Come on, man. Because it's amazing what, what, what in our world system, what gives one person peace, it, it, it causes the other group a problem. <laughs> we, 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 they, they're trying to pass a tax law. Now, they, 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 it's a whole lot of discussion about this tax law. And, and when you break it down and you look at it, for one group of people, it's a lot of peace. It's a lot of prosperity. It's a lot of relief. But for another group, it's a great burden. It's a lot of weight. It begins to cut and diminish benefits that they need. Come on, man. So now how is that? a world peace if it's problematic to one group and only prospers a certain group. Jesus said, I ain't dealing like that. He says, the peace that I've given you is going to relieve you of the trouble of this world that's coming against your heart. Now, if you study the word, you know that your heart is not 
when he starts talking about your heart, he's not talking about your physical organs, but he's talking about your soulless realm. And in your soulless realm is your mind, it's your thoughts, it's your thinking, it's your knowing. So he says, the peace I'm going to give you is going to allow you to maintain the kingdom mindset in spite of what's going on around you. I, 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 I love... I love first responders. Amen. Over 400 died when, when the bombing took place in New York, when the, when, the, when, when the Twin Towers were bombed. They say over 400 first responders perished in that incident. And, it, and it's amazing that what everybody else was running away from, these keepers of peace were willing to run into. When you know who you are, come on, man, and the peace of God is really prevalent in your life, what troubles and moves everybody else away will give you the validity to stand. So God says, Jesus says that the peace that I'm giving you will allow your heart not to be troubled by what you hear or what you see. And it'll allow you not to be moved by the fears that's founded in this earth. This earth system is based upon fear. Are you hearing me? I just read an article that says that uh, in the coming year, they, they, they already start talking about a recession. So whenever they start mentioning the word recession, it immediately evokes fear into people. And then you begin to change how you function, how you flow, how you believe, your, your generosity becomes diminished whenever <laughs> we are recessed. And Jesus says, don't, don't get caught up in that. They're not the giver of your peace. They're not the substantiation of your prosperity. It, 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 it's not their word that you're living by. That's why he tells you in Matthew 6, that you need to seek the kingdom of God and understand out that when you first seek after the kingdom, that then things are added unto you. Deuteronomy 28, 1 tells you to hearken to the voice of the Lord your God this day, and all these things will come, and they will overtake you. God never told you to chase out the things, but he, he set forth a system that will allow things to chase after you. So he tells us that we, 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 we can't get caught up in this way. Then, then number four, watch this. He says that the, the, the eternal ruler has a, an increasing government, meaning it shall be multiplied. The bounds of his kingdom shall be more and more enlarged, and many shall be added to this daily. That when you fall up under the eternal ruler, there is no lack. Can you say that with me? There is no lack. One of the greatest manipulators in this world, I told you, this, the system is based upon fear. Economics, all of us learn about what? Supply and demand. And supply what? Drives the cost. Limited supply, things go up. Plenty of supply, what? Prices go down. Watch this. <laughs> A fear-based system, why? Because whoever controls the price controls the economics of this thing. They determine how much money is made and when it's made. That's not the system where God has given us to live by. He says that Jesus comes with a system that's an increasing government. There is no lack. There is no shortage. Every time there was a need, he became the answer to it. His government, watch this, his government authority, his position as king allowed him to become provider. You missed that. His government authority, authority, that of heaven, his position at king allows him to become provider. So if I fall up under the government authority, I make him king of my life, he becomes the provider for my life. And I don't have to get into the fear of there being lack, shortages in my life. Man, I'm living proof. I'm telling y'all, 
God is being so good. The principles of the kingdom of, of God are working so well in my life. I, I, I don't boast about making poor financial decisions. I boast about the fact that I've outlived them. God's taught me lessons, and he's brought me out of them. I was looking back at some paperwork from about over a period of four years of vehicles I bought. And, and this is not a brag that, you know, it, you know, if you got a job, they, somebody will sell you a car. Yeah, now, now, watch this. They, they, will, they will mishandle you in selling you the car. But if you got a job, you ain't got to have a good job. Somebody will sell you a car. I was looking at the paperwork for when Pastor Kay and I started. I told you, man, I come, we come through some stuff. And one of the cars we bought had a 24% interest rate on it. And then you know what? We was driving that car telling, telling God thank you and, and saying that it was a blessing. Well, it was a blessing above walking maybe, but a 24% interest rate ain't no blessing. Ain't no blessing, no way, no how. Then we traded that one in and we got a 15% because we was working trying to get our name. Are y'all seeing me? We trying to get our name better. We was working. Because the light switch came on, and I realized 24%, that's highway rock. That's not for the children of the kingdom of God. So then, watch this. I had to stop acting and carrying myself like a heathen and submit myself to God's principles. Now, the godly principles said that I needed to pay what I owe, and I need to pay it on time. See, you can't ask God to trespass his word for your privilege. See, and we always want God to make an exception. No. Follow the rules. If you follow God's rules, watch this, your life will be the exception. But all of us look for the exception because we don't want to submit ourselves to the rule. When I begin to submit myself to the rule, the exceptions begin to show up. Now watch this, 15% still ain't good, but it's a whole lot better than 24. So I took 24 and, and, and I took that the other day, and I was, I mean, I took 15. I was like, you know what? I traded in my little Volvo because the transmission went out. I like that car. How come your car always break down when you one year from paying it off? And then the, the transmission costs more than the car was worth. But it, watch this. I took that, traded it in, got out of 15, Walked out the bank this time less than five. I mean, a little, little less than six. Took the other car I had that still had 15 on it. Went the other day. Now watch. Went the other day. I sat in the bank for two hours. But when I walked out the bank, that one was 5.4. When I walked in, it was 15. When I walked out, it was 5.4. When I looked at the time period of paying it off, there was a difference of what I would say was almost five thousand dollars simply because watch I changed how I thought and when I changed how I thought I changed what I did are you with me when I submitted myself to to better principles it produced come on man it produced better when I had poor thinking I had poor product when I got better thinking I got a better product so what I'm telling you is that don't get overwhelmed with where you are if you submit your way of thinking to what God has said. Now, now I went in, man. I went in. I went in, Stephen. They was like, okay, we're going to make this happen, but you need $1,000. I said, I don't want to give you $1,000. So they say, all right, I'll tell you what. We're going to put $1,000 in your account. We're going to take that $1,000 out of your account to pay for the $1,000 that you need. How about that? Sounds good to me. But when I went in, it was problematic. When I came out, it was a praise attached to it. But it all started a couple of years ago when I started to think differently. See, when you start thinking different, the increase that God has for you has a right to manifest in your life, man. Because if God increases you now, what is he going to increase? Will he increase your blessings or your problems? 
So he says this, there is never a shortage in the kingdom of God. There is never lack in the mind of God. The only thing that it is, is us having the ability to come up under, to submit ourselves to the rule of God. Lastly, Jesus says, Jesus is presented as a peaceable government. He shall rule by love. Look at this. He shall rule by love. He shall rule in the hearts or in men's heart that wherever his government is, there shall be what? Peace. And as his government increase, increases, the peace shall increase. He says, now watch. Everything from the kingdom of God, you got to get it, flows from love. Are you with me? Everything in the kingdom of God flows from love. Everything that comes against the kingdom of God is responded to in love. That's why he tells you, look at your neighbors, and he says, look, don't hate them. Love them. He says, but in loving them, you're going to heap coals of fire upon their head. He says that you ain't changing them by coming at them the same way they're coming at you. But if you can come at them the same way I present myself to you, you can change them. And the very thing that was an enemy can become a friend. I'm, I'm just trying to help you. Be it with people or with systems. Are y'all with me? The very system, watch, the very system that put me in persecution, I went back to the same baking system uh, and it became my friend. The same thing that indebted me was the same thing that got me out of debt. The same people that think that they are your persecutor, if you, man, if you hit them back in love, God will make them same people your footstool. And when they try to, watch this, when they're trying to tear you down, they'll be the very ones that had to hold you up. All because I didn't deal with them how I wanted to. I dealt with them from being submitted to the kingdom of God. So I got to understand. I, 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 I got to understand, man, that there's the administration of God, Jesus as the administration, and Jesus as the everlasting kingdom. And it says that he shall order it. That the first thing that, that the administrative gift of God, when he shows up as the administrator in your life, the first thing he sets is order. That nothing happens from the kingdom of God except it be what? In order. The Bible says that he's not a God of confusion. God doesn't manifest in confusion. When he saw confusion, the earth itself was in confusion. The first thing he did was set it and order. Look at Genesis 1 and 1. He says the earth was full of void and darkness, and God set order to it. Before he could ever pull any good thing out of it, God administered order. The first thing that the king, that Jesus as, as the eternal ruler wants to do is set order in your life. Amen? It says this, it says, he shall order it and settle it with justice and judgment. Everything, uh, everything is and shall be well managed in the kingdom of Christ. And look, here, here, here's the part that covers you. And none of his subjects shall ever have a cause to complain. That if I really am submitted, he didn't say that none of, none of us would ever have any problems or any challenges or any adversaries. He says that we'll never have a reason to what? complain. Maybe you need to stop complaining and find that praise in that, com oh boy. find the opportunity to praise him instead of complaining to him. Amen? And then so, lastly it says this, that Jesus shows up as the eternal ruler, as an everlasting kingdom. No end of the increase of peace or happiness of the subjects of the kingdom of God, it will be and eternal. So we've already talked about the peace. That's God's prosperity. Nothing broken, no lack, no sickness. He says it's eternal. It's in this world. Watch this. It's in this world and the world to come. It takes away the fear of transitioning out of this world because I know I, I watch this, my transition out is only my interest in to eternity. Now, I know none of us want to go before we're supposed to go. But I'm telling you that when you are submitted and in proper relationship, there is nothing to be afraid of. Amen? Amen. It says that God himself, 
has undertaken to bring all this about, the Lord of hosts, who has all power in his hands. You serve an all-powerful God who's gifted you. You got to get this. He's gifted you with his best, his son, Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us or God within us. Next week, we're going to talk about the gift of the Holy Spirit and what, how it illuminates in our life. But if you don't get the foundation of receiving this gift that God has presented, then you miss the opportunity for everything else that follows. Amen? Won't you stand on your feet and let's pray?